On April 15, 2015, at 9.47 p.m., Atlanta Police Department received an emergency call from 2850 Peachtree Road N.E., the residence at Buckhead Plaza, Unit 2405. The caller, identified as Valerie Dixon, reported finding an unresponsive male in her luxury condominium. First responders arrived at 9.53 p.m. to discover the body of Malcolm Hughes, 45, lying face-up on the Italian marble floor of the main living area. Malcolm Hughes had sustained a single gunshot wound to the chest from what ballistics later identified as a .38 caliber revolver. The victim's background check revealed his rise from modest beginnings in New Orleans' Ninth Ward. Born on March 3, 1970, Hughes earned a full scholarship to Vanderbilt University in 1988, graduating summa cum laude with a degree in finance in 1992. By 2015, he had established himself as a senior investment banker at Morgan Stanley's Atlanta office, maintaining an annual income exceeding $850,000. Detective Darnell Rogers, a 15-year veteran of Atlanta PD's homicide division with a 92% case closure rate, arrived on scene at 10.15 p.m. The crime scene revealed signs of a violent altercation, an overturned restoration hardware side table, broken crystal decanter, and multiple scuff marks on the walls indicated a physical struggle had occurred. Blood spatter analysis suggested Hughes was shot at close range, approximately three to four feet, while standing. The victim's personal effects, including a Rolex Submariner watch valued at $35,000 and $2,400 in cash, remained untouched in his pockets, immediately ruling out robbery as a primary motive. A preliminary examination of Hughes' phone revealed multiple text messages exchanged with Valerie Dixon earlier that day, confirming their romantic relationship and plans to meet that evening. During initial questioning, Valerie Dixon, 48, owner of Dixon Interior Design Associates, displayed visible emotional distress but maintained composed responses to basic inquiries. Her statement indicated she had returned from a client meeting at 9.40 p.m. to find Hughes unresponsive. Detective Rogers noted Dixon's reluctance to discuss certain aspects of her relationship with Hughes, particularly regarding recent changes to her financial arrangements and her son's knowledge of their involvement. Crime scene technicians recovered multiple pieces of evidence, including the murder weapon, a Smith & Wesson Model 642 revolver found behind a designer sofa, partial fingerprints on a broken whiskey glass, and surveillance footage from the building's security system showing all entries and exits between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. that evening. The position of the body and blood pattern analysis suggested Hughes had been facing his attacker, indicating he likely knew his assailant. Detective Rogers ordered an immediate canvas of neighboring units and a thorough background check on both Hughes and Dixon, suspecting the seemingly straightforward crime scene held deeper implications. Initial interviews with building staff revealed Hughes had been a frequent visitor to Dixon's residence over the past eight months, often arriving late in the evening and departing early the following morning. Background checks conducted by Detective Rogers revealed Valerie Dixon, Nate Thompson, was born on September 12, 1967, in Charlotte, North Carolina. She graduated from the Savannah College of Art and Design in 1989 with a degree in interior design. Records show she married Robert Dixon, a commercial real estate developer, in 1988. Their son, James Robert Dixon, was born on July 3, 1990. On March 18, 2000, Robert Dixon died in a single vehicle accident on I-85 near Commerce, Georgia. The accident report indicated his Mercedes S-Class hydroplane during heavy rain, resulting in a fatal collision with a concrete barrier. The insurance payout of $2.5 million, combined with Robert's business assets, provided Valerie with significant financial stability. Dixon Interior Design Associates, founded in 1995.
grew from a small residential design firm into a prominent commercial and residential enterprise with annual revenues exceeding $4.8 million by 2015. The company's client list included Fortune 500 executives, professional athletes, and several luxury hotel chains across the southeastern United States. Interviews with Karen Matthews, Valerie's close friend and business associate since 2003, revealed significant details about Valerie's personal life. According to Matthews, Valerie channeled all her grief into building her business and raising James. She declined to date for nearly a decade after Robert's death, focusing entirely on creating a legacy for her son. Financial records obtained through subpoena showed Valerie maintained meticulous control over her company and personal assets. By 2015, her net worth was estimated at $12.3 million, including real estate holdings, investment portfolios, and business equity. Documentation revealed her intention to transfer 30% ownership of Dixon Interior Design Associates to James upon his completion of business school. Malcolm Hughes entered Valerie's life in June 2014 through a mutual client. Their relationship progressed rapidly, with Hughes becoming increasingly involved in both personal and professional aspects of Valerie's life. Bank records indicate joint investment ventures beginning in January 2015, including a $1.2 million commercial property purchase in Buckhead. Detective Rogers' interview with Patricia Sullivan, Valerie's sister, revealed growing family tensions. According to Sullivan's statement, Valerie began changing after Malcolm came into the picture. She started talking about restructuring the business, possibly bringing in outside investors. James was devastated when he learned she was considering selling part of the company to fund expansion plans Malcolm had proposed. Email correspondence recovered from Valerie's computer showed multiple drafts of amended business plans and succession strategies, significantly different from her original intentions. The most recent draft, dated April 10, 2015, outlined a proposed merger with an investment group led by Malcolm Hughes, which would have effectively diluted James's future stake in the company to less than 10%. Detective Rogers' investigation expanded through interviews with the victims and Dixon family social circle, revealing a complex web of relationships and hidden motives. Karen Matthews, Valerie's closest friend and confidant, provided crucial insights during her official statement at police headquarters. According to Matthews, James had become increasingly distressed about his mother's relationship with Malcolm Hughes, confiding in her about his suspicions regarding Hughes's true intentions. Matthews recounted specific instances where James expressed his concerns. He would call me late at night, worried about Malcolm's influence over his mother. James believed Malcolm was systematically isolating Valerie from her family and longtime friends. He noticed how Malcolm subtly discouraged Valerie from attending family gatherings and traditional Sunday dinners with James. Investigation into Malcolm Hughes's financial records revealed troubling patterns. Despite his apparent success at Morgan Stanley, Hughes had accumulated substantial personal debt, including a $475,000 mortgage on a Buckhead townhouse, $125,000 in credit card debt, and several high-interest personal loans totaling $280,000. His lifestyle significantly exceeded his income, suggesting financial pressure may have motivated his pursuit of Valerie Dixon. Michael Crawford, Hughes's colleague at Morgan Stanley, disclosed that Hughes had recently faced an internal audit regarding irregularities in client accounts. While the audit cleared Hughes of wrongdoing, it revealed his aggressive investment strategies and tendency to blur ethical lines. Crawford stated that Hughes had openly discussed his plans to secure his future through his relationship with Valerie Dixon. Further investigation uncovered draft amendments to Valerie's will, prepared by her attorney Stephen Bennett. The documents showed multiple revisions over six months, each version increasing Hughes's potential inheritance. The final draft, 
never signed, would have granted Hughes control over 40% of Dixon Interior Design Associates and a significant portion of Valerie's personal assets. Email correspondence between Hughes and his financial advisor revealed discussions about leveraging his relationship with Valerie to resolve his debt issues. In one particularly damning exchange, Hughes wrote, Once the merger is complete and the new structure is in place, I'll finally have access to the capital needed to clear these obligations. James remains the only obstacle to securing this arrangement. The investigation also revealed that Hughes had hired a private investigator to compile a dossier on James, including details about his gambling history and failed business school career. This information appeared intended as leverage to diminish James's influence over his mother's business decisions. The private investigator's reports were found in Hughes's office safe alongside documentation of James's casino debts. Surveillance footage from various locations around Atlanta showed multiple confrontations between Hughes and James in the weeks leading up to the murder. Security cameras at restaurants, parking garages, and the Dixon Interior Design Associates office captured increasingly hostile interactions between the two men, culminating in a physical altercation at a local coffee shop that required intervention from other patrons. Security footage from the residence at Buckhead Plaza revealed James Dixon entering the building through the main lobby. Building records showed he used his authorized key fob to access the elevator and his mother's floor. The surveillance system captured him entering Unit 2405 using his personal key, demonstrating his familiar access to the property. During subsequent interrogation at police headquarters, James Dixon, accompanied by his attorney David Stern, provided a detailed account of the evening's events. His statement described entering the condo to confront Hughes about his influence over Valerie Dixon's business and personal decisions. The conversation, according to James, quickly escalated into a heated argument. Detective Rogers presented James with evidence recovered from the crime scene, including fingerprints on the murder weapon and DNA evidence suggesting a physical altercation. Under mounting pressure, James modified his initial statement, admitting to a physical confrontation with Hughes, but maintaining that the shooting was unintentional, I brought the gun to scare him. I wanted him to understand how serious I was about protecting my mother. I never meant to pull the trigger. The breakthrough in the investigation came when Valerie Dixon requested a private meeting with Detective Rogers. During this emotional interview, she revealed signing a new will two days before Hughes's death. The document, prepared by her attorney, allocated 35% of her business assets to Hughes and reduced James's inheritance significantly. This information had been disclosed to James during a heated family discussion the morning before the murder. Valerie's testimony provided crucial context. I told James about the changes to my will over breakfast. He became extremely agitated, accusing me of betraying his father's memory. I had never seen him so angry. He stormed out, saying he would make things right. I should have recognized the warning signs. Broken furniture and displaced items corroborated this sequence of events. The fatal shot was fired from close range, suggesting an intimate struggle rather than a calculated execution. Forensic examination of James's phone revealed text messages sent to his friend Marcus Thompson shortly before entering the building, going to end this tonight. Mom will finally see him for what he is. This evidence contradicted James's claim that the confrontation was unplanned, suggesting premeditation. During the final phase of questioning, James's composure cracked as Detective Rogers presented the timeline of events. His revised statement revealed deeper motivations. When Mom told me about the will, everything became clear. Malcolm had one. He was going to take everything to the business, the legacy, even my place in my mother's life. I couldn't let that happen. Dad made me promise to protect her. Valerie Dixon's subsequent interview revealed her growing awareness of her role in the tragedy.
She acknowledged how her actions, driven by a desire for personal happiness and business expansion, had inadvertently created an untenable situation. Her statement captured the complexity of the family dynamic. I was so focused on building a future with Malcolm that I couldn't see how it was destroying my relationship with James. I never imagined it would end like this. The investigation took a decisive turn when Detective Rogers interviewed Sarah Chen, a resident of Unit 2407. Chen reported seeing James Dixon exit his mother's condo at approximately 11.42 p.m., his typically immaculate appearance noticeably disheveled. His hands were shaking as he waited for the elevator, Chen stated. When he saw me, he quickly looked away and turned toward the stairwell instead. Forensic analysis provided compelling physical evidence linking James to the crime. The Glock 19 recovered from the scene carried multiple fingerprint patterns matching James's right hand, particularly around the grip and trigger. DNA analysis of tissue samples from beneath Malcolm Hughes's fingernails revealed a match to James's genetic profile, consistent with a violent struggle. Blood spatter patterns on James's designer workout jacket, recovered from his apartment's washing machine, survived the attempted cleanup and matched Hughes's DNA. When presented with this evidence during his third interview, James maintained his initial narrative of an accidental discharge during a heated confrontation. Malcolm came at me, he insisted, his voice steady but his right hand repeatedly clenching. I pulled the gun to keep him back, to make him listen. He grabbed for it, and it just went off. Detective Rogers then revealed the digital evidence that unraveled James's careful narrative. At 9.17 p.m. on the night of the murder, James had sent a series of text messages to his friend Marcus Thompson. Tonight, I end this. He thinks he can just walk in and take everything from me? After tonight, Mom will finally see the truth about him. The messages established a clear timeline of premeditation, directly contradicting James's claim of an impulsive confrontation. When Rogers displayed the messages on the interview room monitor, James's composed facade began to crack. His breathing became irregular, and sweat beaded on his forehead. You don't understand, James said, his voice breaking. He was destroying everything. The business my father built, the family's legacy, my relationship with mom, he was systematically taking it all. I found documents on his laptop showing he'd been planning this for months. He had spreadsheets calculating mom's net worth, projections of the business's future value, even research on how to contest wills in Georgia. Further investigation of Hughes's laptop confirmed James's allegations about the spreadsheets, adding another layer of complexity to the case. Hughes had indeed maintained detailed financial projections and scenarios involving Valerie Dixon's assets, suggesting his romantic interest may have been influenced by financial motivations. However, Rogers's case notes emphasized that this discovery did not mitigate the premeditated nature of James's actions. Suspect's awareness of victim's potential ulterior motives appears to have fueled his resentment and solidified his determination to eliminate perceived threat to family wealth slash relationships. Evidence suggests careful planning rather than heat of moment reaction. The recovery of James's phone revealed additional damning evidence. His search history in the weeks leading up to the murder included queries such as Georgia's self defense laws. How to make a shooting look like self-defense. Gunshot residue detection time. Best caliber for close-range effectiveness. These searches, combined with security footage showing James practicing at a shooting range three times in the week before the murder, painted a picture of careful preparation rather than spontaneous violence. The State of Georgia vs. James Robert Dixon became one of Atlanta's most publicized trials of the year. The Fulton County Courthouse filled daily with spectators, journalists, and members of Atlanta's business elite, all drawn to the tragic story of family, betrayal, and murder that unfolded in courtroom 4A. District Attorney Sarah Martinez opened the prosecution's case with a powerful statement, 
This is not a story about protecting family legacy. This is a story about a man who believed his birthright entitled him to control his mother's life, her business, and ultimately, who she could love. The prosecution methodically presented evidence of James's premeditation, from his shooting range practice to his incriminating text messages and internet searches. The trial's most emotional moment came during Valerie Dixon's testimony. Dressed in black, her usual confident demeanor replaced by visible grief, she addressed the court, I lost everything that mattered to me in a single night. My partner was taken from me, and my son. Her voice broke. My son became someone I no longer recognized. I keep asking myself what I could have done differently, what signs I missed. The jury deliberated for 27 hours before returning their verdict. As the foreman read guilty of murder in the first degree, James maintained the same controlled expression he'd worn throughout the trial, but his hands trembled slightly. Only when Judge Harrison pronounced the sentence, life imprisonment without possibility of parole, did his composure finally break. In her victim impact statement, Valerie addressed her son directly, James, your father wanted you to protect me, but he never meant for you to own me. Malcolm wasn't destroying our family's legacy, your actions did that. Now I've lost both the man I chose to love and the son I've always loved. Some days, I don't know which loss hurts more. The aftermath of the trial left deep scars in Atlanta's social fabric. Dixon Interior Design Associates, once a cornerstone of Atlanta's luxury design industry, was sold to a national corporation. The Buckhead Condo, still bearing evidence of the tragic night despite professional cleaning, went on the market at a significantly reduced price. Detective Rogers' final case notes reflected the profound impact of the investigation in my 23 years on the force. Few cases have illustrated so clearly how wealth and privilege can't protect against the devastating consequences of unchecked jealousy and possessiveness. The Dixon case wasn't just about solving a murder, it was about watching a family implode from the inside out. Six months after the trial, Valerie Dixon quietly left Atlanta, leaving no forwarding address. Sources close to her indicated she had purchased a small property in coastal Maine, far from the reminders of her former life. The elegant showrooms of Dixon Interior Design Associates became a high-end furniture store, and the family's name gradually faded from Atlanta's social registers. James Dixon began serving his sentence at Georgia State Prison in Reedsville. His appeals, citing emotional distress and temporary insanity, were systematically rejected. Prison records indicated he refused all visitors, including his mother's single attempt to see him three months after his incarceration. The case became required study material at Georgia State University's criminal justice program, particularly in courses dealing with family violence and premeditated crimes. Professor Angela Martinez, who developed the case study, noted the Dixon case demonstrates how wealth, privilege, and family dynamics can create a perfect storm of psychological pressures. It's a stark reminder that the most dangerous threats often come from within our closest circles. Detective Rogers kept one memento from the case, a photo of the Dixon family taken at James's high school graduation, showing a beaming Valerie with her arm around a younger, happier James. The photo served as a reminder that behind every crime story lies a human tragedy, and that the true cost of justice often extends far beyond the courtroom walls. As Atlanta's social circles gradually found new topics for discussion, the Dixon case faded into local legend, a cautionary tale about the destructive power of possessive love and the thin line between protection and control. The empty Dixon mansion in Buckhead stood as a silent testament to how quickly a family's carefully constructed world could unravel, leaving behind only questions about what might have been. Detective Rogers often returned to this case in his reflections, noting that the worst crimes are often committed not by hardened criminals, but by ordinary people caught up in their own emotions and bad decisions. 
Valerie Dixon, starting a new life in Maine, has dedicated herself to working with charitable organizations that help families in crisis. Her personal tragedy was transformed into a desire to help others avoid a similar fate. This story has become part of Atlanta's urban folklore, a reminder that even the most prosperous families are not immune to tragedy if they allow jealousy, fear, and mistrust to erode the foundation of family relationships. It serves as a timeless reminder that true love is not found in control and possessiveness, but in the ability to let go and allow loved ones to be happy in their own way.